okay, thank you very much for uh, the invitation. Thank you very much for being there. Uh, the, the topic of my presentation this morning will be uh, about making a valid application to the ECHR, um, uh, where I will point to some of the say best practices and common mistakes that appear uh, in this context. The structure of the presentation will be the following. Uh, so I will firstly cover a little bit about the whole structure and organization of the European Court of Human Rights, which may or may not be known to all of you. Then we will see uh, how an application uh, uh, starts at the domestic level and then continues before the European Court of Human Rights uh, in the session, which will be about the life of an application. And then we will discuss first administrative requirements of making a valid application to the court and then also briefly admiss admissibility criteria. I have to say that for admissibility criteria, uh, probably one would need uh, a good one or, or two seminars to, to go through all the details. So I will point uh, in today's presentation only to those that are really critical for making a valid application to the court. Uh, I guess that some theoretical discussion on the European Convention on Human Rights and the establishment of the court uh, is not needed. But I would simply want to point out to the fact that we do have to appreciate the fact that the court uh, was established as a unique international body, whereby immediately after the Second World War, so we, we have to take things from, from that perspective, historical perspective, uh, uh, international community or European community decided that individuals would be able to bring their governments to court in order to argue uh, on, or, or in order to make those governments comply with their basic uh, fundamental or human rights. Uh, this was in 1950 and, uh, and the court which was established to deal with those uh, problems first started operating in 1959 adopting the first judgment in 1960. And since then, this court processed uh, uh, over 1 million of applications and it adopted uh, 26,000 judgments and there were uh, much more, uh, probably thousands uh, of hundreds and thousands of various decisions that this court has adopted. I think these numbers are are really fascinating and they talk about not only the importance of the court, but they also talk about the workload and the pressure on the court, uh, which is very often expressed uh, in the saying that the court has become victim of its own success. So these new applications that are constantly coming and being processed by the court. There were four, I would say, major reforms of the convention system. The first major reform, which is really the biggest one in my view, is the one that happened in November 1998, where the new court was established. You will probably know that before 1998, the whole system uh, existed in two tiers. So first you had European Commission that was examining the admissibility of the complaints, and then the, you had the court which could provide judicial ruling over uh, the dispute. However, in 1998, commission was, adopt, uh, was um, abolished and uh, a new, uh, uh, unique, fully operating court uh, was established. Then second major reform happened in 2010, uh, where many instruments were adopted to ensure long-term efficiency of the system. You should understand that about those years, in, in fact, in 2011, mid-2011, so at the moment when this reform still didn't manage to be put fully into place, the court had the peak of the absolute number of pending cases, which was more than 160,000 pending uh, cases on its docket. And this reform with Protocol 14 aimed to ensure that the court can filter those cases uh, before it. So the Institute of Single Judge was established with this protocol, um, uh, wider competences of the committees and some other uh, measures were introduced as well. And then we have uh, the two most recent protocols, 15 and 16. Uh, 15 being the one that introduces the principle of subsidiarity and margin of appreciation in the preamble of the convention but also changes some practical things such as shortening the, uh, the six month time limit to four months, 
we'll discuss this later, uh, and also making some changes to the criterion of uh, non-significant disadvantage, which we will also discuss later. And then Protocol 16, uh, which introduces a possibility of the European Court of Human Rights giving advisory opinion on the convention issues, so resolving uh, issues out of the contentious uh, uh, procedure. The court at the moment consists, consists of 46 judges, uh, which are elected in respect of 46 Council of Europe member states. What is important is that they are not elected by the member states, but by the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, and they are not judges of those states. They are simply elected in respect of uh, the Council of Europe member states, but then once elected, they fully act independently and impartial and uh, impartial, completely uh, separate from their uh, governments. Uh, judges are elected for a nine-year uh, term in office, which is non-renewable. I initially said that at the moment the court has 46 judges, and this is because until last year, September last year, the court had 47 judges, the, the, the 47th one being the one elected in respect of the Russian Federation, which is uh, since uh, uh, 16 September last year, no longer a contracting party to the European Convention on Human Rights, and therefore now we have 46 judges. The, the plenary court, being all the judges of the court, elect their own president and two vice presidents who are elected for a term in office of three years. And then these 46 judges, they sit in five sections. So you will very often see that a judgment so-and-so was adopted by section one, two, three, or five. Each section has a section president and also vice presidents who are elected for a term in office of two years. Your respective countries against whom you may lodge an application will so inevitably be divided in one of the sections uh, where this country, the idea is to have always geographical uh, uh, division of Europe in different sections to have judges with different backgrounds or university professors, experts in international law, criminal civil law, uh, and so on. And also gender balance uh, between section, in, within sections is also important. The court sits in these four judicial formations. Uh, the first judicial formation is the single judge formation. Uh, single judges can only rule on inadmissible, inadmissible cases, so single judge the only competence he or she has is to declare a case inadmissible. Um, single judge can never be the judge elected in respect of the country against uh, which uh, the application has been lodged. Then there are committees. These are, these are formations of three judges and they can decide cases only which are subject to well-established case law of the court. They can declare cases inadmissible, but they can also find violations. They have to act unanimously, and the, the uh, judge elected in respect of the country concerned, which for, uh, for the sake of convenience I will call national judge, that does not necessarily have to sit in a committee, but may be invited by other members uh, of the committee to sit in the formation in order to explain the national context. Then the default formation of the court is chamber of seven judges. Uh, uh, chambers uh, uh, must include, by virtue of the convention, they must include the national judge, so the judge elected in respect of the country, so that that judge can explain national context and domestic law where needed. And then the highest formation of the court is the grand chamber formation of 17 judges, which can be seized either, either by relinquishment, uh, uh, which means a case that would uh, in the first instance and the last be decided by the Grand Chamber or uh, can be seized upon referral of a case from the Chamber. We will see a little bit later about, uh, about this, these processes. And then there are two specific formations. One is duty judge. This is a single judge who is competent to rule on interim uh, measures under Rule uh, 39. And there, is, there has been uh, recently established a thematic committee for immigration-related cases. So these are, uh, this is a committee of judges who uh, hold expertise in, in immigration matters, and then they rule in such uh, cases.
cases. The idea of thematic committees is a long one. Uh, this is the first step and we will see whether further thematic committees or maybe even in future chamber, chambers will be formed for other uh, issues. Uh, the court also has its registry. Registry is not to be confused with registry that exists in national uh, legal orders, where it's purely of, of the administrative or technical uh, nature. In the European Court of Human Rights, registry provides both legal and administrative support to the court. It's composed of lawyers, it has administrative and other technical staff like IT experts and uh, a certain number of translators. There are at the moment uh, more than 640 staff members of the registry. They are all employed by the Council of Europe on the basis of uh, open uh, competitions and they are in no way dependent on the respective states from which they come. The court itself, so the plenary court, elects registrar and deputy registrar and there are also section registrars and deputy section registrars, so those uh, assigned to the five sections that I previously mentioned. There is a special unit which is called filtering section. Uh, filtering section is dealing with inadmissible cases and, and, uh, and processes, uh, also cases which are subject to the well-established case law of the court. So this is a section which allows for swift and summary processing of, of cases. And then finally, there is the service of the Juris Council, which is the uh, uh, legal service of legal advice within the court, which is in charge of ensuring quality and consistency of the case law, which means ensuring that the case law is internally consistent and also up to date and consistent with the uh, with various international uh, uh, standards. To give you uh, a feeling of statistics, uh, and this is simply briefly you will see that in 2022, so last year we received 45, uh, uh, more than 45,000 applications. These are applications that were allocated to judicial formation, which means that even past, these are applications that passed the uh, administrative, first administrative review, which means that even more applications have uh, been lodged. This is a slight increase, and in recent years, the number is constantly around 40, 45,000 applications per year. The numbers are, uh, however, with how the applications were decided uh, is also something to be noted. So 79% of them were declared inadmissible, 10% were st uh, struck out, which may be on the basis either of a friendly settlement or loss of interest of the applicant, or on the basis of a unilateral declaration by the government uh, result, uh, acknowledging the violation and providing compensation. Um, for the moment, in this year, we have received some 25,000 new applications, and this is to be seen what will happen until the end of the, uh, uh, of the year. What is also very much striking, I would think, is that uh, currently we have 78,000 applications pending, but these applications are divided. You see, we have five countries which make uh, basically two thirds uh, of all the applications we have. We have Turkey, which uh, has 31%, then followed by Russia, which is no longer a contracting party, but the court still retains um, a certain jurisdiction, which is called residual jurisdiction in Russian cases, and then followed by Ukraine, Romania, Italy, and then some other uh, uh, countries. Um, so this shows that uh, basically resolving the uh, backlog of cases in some of these uh, countries would significantly reduce the overall backlog of pending cases and allow the court to function and operate more, um, uh, more effectively. We turn now to the life of an application and for you, I think it's critical to know that particularly for you who are uh, uh, defense counsels intending to lodge or having an application in the court is to know that there is a priority policy within the court which classifies different applications in seven different categories. And these categories determine the order in which an application will be taken into account for processing. So the first category, those that is given absolute priority are urgent applications. And these are applications where there is some 
uh, risk to life or health in this kind of emergency, uh, very critical situations uh, where uh, serious irreparable damage will even occur. Then the second category are applications which give rise, uh, which have the impact on the overall effectiveness of the convention system. Uh, these are what would be normally called pilot and quasi-pilot uh, procedures, uh, lead, leading judgments in such cases which are really critical uh, to define certain issues at the, Euro at the global European level. Third level are applications which concern core rights, which are listed here. You see 234 and Article 5. Then category four is potentially well-founded applications which are based on other articles. Then category five uh, relates to well-established case law of the court. This is the one that concerns committee jurisdiction. And then six and seven are inadmissible uh, applications. The biggest difficulty with this priority policy is uh, in cases that belong to the fourth category, which is the potentially well-founded applications based on other articles. These may be applications that are very important either for the overall development of the European order or for the country concerned, but at the same time, they may not concern core rights. And at the same time, uh, it is possible that there are not still so many cases pending before the court, which would trigger some sort of a pilot or quasi-pilot procedure to bring those cases into uh, category uh, two. And uh, historically, we had a certain conjunction, I would say, in this category four, where we had some very important cases uh, uh, that were pending, uh, that were in that category, and simply it took too much time to process them because they were not high in the order. The court uh, decided to deal with this with a new uh, uh, strategy that came into force in March 2021, which is called a court that matters where uh, a special category which is called category four high was established and these cases are now they call nowadays uh, they are called impact cases these are cases that raise very important issue of relevance for the, for the state or for the overall, overall convention system and may not fall under some of the other uh, priority categories so these are uh, cases that are now given uh, priority on the basis of this category four uh, ha. The court has also adopted summary formula judgments and decisions. This is something that applies to a well-established case law of the court. Uh, this, these judgments and decisions, and I want to emphasize this, are subject to committed, committed jurisdiction and normally committed jurisdictions are, jurisdiction is not considered to be creating case law. So committees are applying but not creating case law and therefore I would advise you not to refer to committee uh, to committee judgments and decisions because in terms of jurisprudential value they are not considered to be uh, to be creating a case and i have to say for me it's sometimes strange to see that some national courts refer heavily to some of our committee uh, rulings or when i see commentators that make long blog posts on a committee uh, judgment or decision. But there, there we are, but this is for you important too. And you also have pilot and quasi-pilot judgment procedures. So these are procedures which are also probably known to you and they concern a situation where there is a high number of cases pending before the court and where the court can, uh, 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 can take one case for processing, adjourn the examination of other cases until the key problem has not been resolved in the leading uh, case. Uh, as regards the very life of an application, of course, the whole uh, proceedings start at the national level. Uh, all domestic remedies have to be exhausted and have to be exhausted properly, and we will discuss this shortly. And then when the case comes before the European Court of Human Rights, it first goes through the admissibility uh, assessment or the initial analysis of the admissibility. If it passes the initial an, uh, analysis of the uh, admissibility, it can lead uh, either in the subsequent uh, uh, stages of examination, it can still uh, be declared inadmissible. But if not, then there is a judgment which finds a violation. Uh, 
If the judgment finding a violation is adopted by a committee of three judges, the case ends there. There is no possibility of re-examination of the case in any uh, uh, form. Uh, but as we said, these are judgments that are based, first of all, on well-established case law of the court, and secondly, they don't create case law. So this is the justification of that process. If the finding of a violation has been made by a chamber of seven judges, there is a possibility of re-examination by the case by the grand chamber. Uh, this is subject to a referral request, uh, which is decided by a panel of five judges whether that case would be referred to the grand chamber or not. If the case is adopted, when the case is adopted by the grand chamber, this is where the proceedings end. The execution of the court's judgments is in the competence of the Committee of Ministers, uh, uh, which is a political process of pressure, or of peer pressure on the states to adopt. Uh, to comply with the court's uh, judgment. Uh, this is a simplified version of the right or of the of the life of an individual uh, application. And here you see what I previously said, different formations of the court which can adopt different rulings. So single judges can declare cases only inadmissible. Committees may declare them either inadmissible or find a judgment uh, finding a violation, which goes to the Committee of Ministers for execution, or then Chamber can also either declare it inadmissible, it may adopt a judgment, or it may immediately relinquish the case to the Grand Chamber, or the case may end up in the Grand Chamber upon a, a, a referral. A Grand Chamber, when it adopts a judgment, this is the final stage uh, in the life of an application of the court. And uh, a part, important thing is to say that not many cases end up in the ground chamber. This is really exceptional procedure, and the concept of referral should not be confused to an appeal at the domestic level. Um, now I turn to the administrative requirements for making a valid application. And the first administrative requirement of which you are probably aware and probably which makes you a little bit anxious is this famous Rule 47 of the Rules uh, of Court. Uh, uh, it's a relatively long text, um, uh, which I would advise you to check in the courts, uh, uh, in the Rules of Court. But what's very important is that on the court's website, and it is indicated here, and uh, if later on the presentation will be available to you, this is hyperlinked, so you can simply click on this link, and this can lead you to detailed instructions how to fill in uh, an, uh, an application to the court. Um, I know that many of you will have some criticism and maybe even bad experience with some Rule 47 situations and processing, but uh, I think that if you go back to the number of applications that we receive per year, uh, if you go back to the number of applications that are pending before the court, then I think you will understand the logic of Rule 47, which is based on the principle of self-sufficiency of an application form. A self-sufficiency of, of an application form means that a lawyer who receives an application for the initial sifting and examination needs to be based needs to be uh, able on the basis only on the application form to understand what the problem in the case is and what the complaints are and what are the and whether the requirements of admissibility criteria have been uh, uh, met i have to say that at the time when i came to the court which was more than 10 years ago and when i used to work in case processing sector but there was no rule 47 as it is today uh, application forms used to come, uh, and I processed myself such applications on more than 150 pages, where a couple of pages would be in handwriting, then a couple of pages would be typed, then there would be a couple of newspaper articles, then there would be three academic articles, then uh, um, handwritten complaints would continue and so on. Uh, if you multiply this by, uh, by approximately 50,000 applications we receive, then you see that it's almost impossible to work uh, in this way. Um, 
And so the court did introduce some rigor in Rule 47, introduced the obligation that the applications uh, now are submitted only by the use of the application form, which is provided by the court. What is also important to say is that there are exceptions uh, and they are provided under Rule 47, this is paragraph 5.1, which allows you to, if for whatever reason you were unable to comply with all the requirements of the application form in Rule 47, that you provide the reasoning for this and then your request for, a, for an exemption will be uh, examined. Typical example of exemptions that were so far granted is, is a situation where you have a prisoner who is writing from from the situation of solitary confinement, say, or other isolation, where uh, he or she could not get access to an application form. But these are really exceptions, and as a rule, uh, uh, Rule 47 has to be complied with. And another uh, mystery that I want to break over Rule 47 is that this is not really rocket science. It's a simple uh, form which you have here, which probably are all uh, uh, aware of, which can be downloaded on the court's website which simply has to be filled in just like any other form. Uh, uh, so I would, I would really advise you to go step by step, fill, fill in all the, all the categories of the application form that are, uh, that are required. Application forms need to be sent only by post. So uh, uh, those that are sent by email, those that, those, those that are sent by other means, fax and so on, are not accepted. They have to come by post. The date of submission is the date when you put it to the, when you gave it to the post office. Uh, Rule 47 and all these procedures for submitting an application form don't apply when it comes to urgent interim measure requests under Rule 39. There is a special procedure for this, which again you can find in the hyperlink here. So they go electronically and all these procedures about the application form do not uh, apply. Uh, this is a list of common mistakes uh, which, uh, which happen in the application form so far submitted to the court. And uh, I would simply briefly uh, lead you through them, but you can find more details on the court's website or the, in the hyperlink that I provided. The, the most uh, classic problem is not using the current application form, but without justified reason using some other uh, form. Then summary of the case has, be put, has to be put on the application form. It cannot come in a separate uh, document. So it has to be in the allocated pages in the application form. Then uh, you have situations where no decisions and domestic documents are attached. Uh, uh, what's important here is that you provide original documents and decisions in the language of the country in which they, are, they were uh, adopted. Uh, so please don't provide translations unless with the translation you will also provide the copies of the original document. If you provide only translation, it may be considered that you didn't provide the relevant uh, decisions and documents. Your case in all likelihood will initially be sifted by the lawyer who knows the language of the, of the, of the judicial proceedings at the domestic level, so documents and decisions uh, can and must be submitted in their uh, original language. Um, then uh, documents also have to be uh, provided uh, showing that compliance with the six month time limit, oh, six month previously and now four month time limit has been complied with. So documents where you have certain stamps by courts or your own stamp in the office showing when you receive certain uh, documents. Then all original signatures have to be uh, on the application form. And what's also important in the application form, you have a special category for company representatives. Don't skip them. You have to identify the official representative uh, of the company. You also have to fill in all the categories, including statement of uh, uh, violations. Uh, and uh, you have to detail the use of uh, respective uh, uh, remedies of the domestic law. Very often it also happens, and this is taken strictly by the, by the filtering teams, is that the country is not, you have a special box to tick the country against which you are submitting an application. And the logic here being is that the lawyer who is initially sifting the case 
shouldn't go to your application to figure out against which country you are submitting your case. Sometimes it may be obvious, but sometimes it may, uh, it may not. Then uh, you have to put the, you have to list the documents in the form uh, properly so they can easily be scanned and, uh, and reviewed. Um, for the moment, uh, the court is not accepting separate authority form, uh, but requires that the authority form, which is on the application, which is together with the application form or other part of the application form has to be uh, submitted. Whether this will change, I don't know, but, but we will see. For the moment, please don't, don't provide your separate authority forms, but keep the one which is on the application uh, form. Then one of the common, common mistakes which is listed here is this sending the application form at the last uh, moment. The problem here is that if you didn't comply with Rule 47, your application is considered as being never submitted. It is then administratively returned to you, but you can still submit a complete and new application form within the relevant four month uh, time limit. Uh, if you submit your application form at the very last moment, you are risking of, uh, in, in case that there is no Rule 47 compliance, you are risking of uh, uh, missing this four-month four time limit uh, uh, because you simply didn't have time to submit a new application form. And then if, you, if the application form has been returned to you administratively on the basis of Rule 47, you cannot simply fill in the missing aspect of it. So if your application has been returned because you didn't list the remedies, you cannot return the application simply one page of the remedies listed. You have to submit the complete new application form like you're submitting it uh, for the first time. The logic of this being that this is the moment when the application form has been sent. Let's go now, uh, uh, as I said, uh, briefly through the, uh, through the admissibility criteria, which would require probably much longer discussion, but I will point to the most critical aspects of them. The first is that the individual who is submitting the application uh, uh, to the court has to, uh, has to be a victim or alleged victim of a violation of the convention. This may be somebody who may be directly affected by the measure complained of, or somebody who, by a certain ricochet from the direct victim, is affected by the violation concerned of, and these are called indirect uh, victims. There is a concept of potential victim, so somebody who may be potentially affected by the current legislation, for example, in the state, or may be potentially affected in future, but what is not permitted under the convention is actio popularis. So it's not possible to have a general litigation before the court about global uh, issues, which don't necessarily affect you in a sufficiently direct or indirect way. Uh, it is also possible that there may be loss of victim status either at the domestic level already or after the, the application has been launched to the court, but the loss of victim status happens only in two uh, 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 situations which have to be cumulatively met. First, there has to be acknowledgement at the domestic level of a breach of the convention, right? And there has to be uh, a redress offered to the, uh, uh, to the applicant. Uh, one of the aspects of the victim status is also representation. Representation here is important for you as lawyers representing a victim. Representation means that the lawyer is in contact with the victim at the moment of the lodging of the application and throughout the proceedings. If the lawyer loses contact with the victim, you risk your case being uh, uh, struck out. So lawyer must be constantly in contact with the victim and must be able to show that such contact existed in case this is challenged uh, by the government or requested by the court. With respect to re representation, it is also important to stress that in very, very exceptional circumstances, it is possible to submit an application on behalf of another person. This is possible when there is a risk that that other person would not be able, uh, due to some particular vulnerability, to present the case himself or herself. Uh, and when there is no conflict of interest. So very exceptionally, we have accepted NGOs litigating cases on behalf of individuals who are in 
uh, uh, mental health institutions who couldn't submit applications uh, on, on their own. Uh, the criteria for uh, admissibility, which are provided in paragraph one of Article 35, is primarily exhaustion of domestic remedies and compliance with the relevant time limit. Exhaustion of domestic remedies means that you have to duly comply with the process of using a remedy at the domestic level. And in case you have any doubt as to the effectiveness of a remedy, it would not be in itself a, a reason for not using a remedy. In recent times, particularly with the, with the laws, more increasing emphasis on the principle of, um, of uh, subsidiarity, the court has become very strict with the requirements of exhaustion. So please make sure to exhaust your remedies properly, which means that from the beginning of the case, you have to put, if you intend to argue a convention issue in the case, you have to put your case on the right track. Uh, uh, this means that the convention has to be argued, has to be invoked at the domestic level, uh, and opportunities should be given to the domestic authorities to rule on something before this is submitted uh, to the European Court. Uh, for you, important information that the previous six month time limit for the submission of an application after the coming into force of protocol number 15 is a four month. Uh, uh, time limit. However, uh, the protocol 15 had a transitionary period, uh, so this four-month time limit came into force only on 1st February 2022, and it applies to those decisions which are domestic, where the final domestic decision is taken after this date. Uh, so if your final domestic decision is taken on 2nd February 2022, uh, a four-month time limit uh, applies. But the complication that happened uh, is that where the final domestic decision was adopted before this date, but it was served on the applicant after this date. And the question for the court there was whether a four month or six month time limit uh, is to be uh, applied. This was resolved in this case, Orhan and Turkey last year. Uh, where the court said that in, in such a situation, uh, the six month time limit would apply because the final domestic decision was adopted before 1st February 2022. Uh, but then the running of the, of the time limit is calculated on the basis of the date of the receipt of the final domestic decision on, or other notification of the final domestic decision, which in this particular case against Turkey happened after the critical uh, date. Applications to the court cannot be uh, anonymous, so applicant has to be clearly indicated, but this is not a problem that often happens. And the application should not be substantially the same. This means that it shouldn't concern the same facts and it shouldn't concern the same applicant. Uh, it is not so problematic as regards substantially the same application submitted to the court, but for you lawyers, it's important to know that there is international nebison in the rule, which means that the court will not examine a case which is substantially the same as the one submitted to another international body of investigation or, or settlement. So if you intend to submit your case in parallel to the, say, Human Rights Committee and the court, you will not, due to this international medicine, be able to obtain uh, the ruling by the court. Different uh, other international uh, bodies, all of them more or less have uh, this international medicine rule, but they apply differently. The court is here very strict and, and the case which is either submitted or decided or being examined by another body uh, could not be examined by the court. Then uh, abuse of the right of application. Here it's also very important for you lawyers to try to, uh, I, I'm sure you're all sufficiently professionally diligent and wouldn't make something which would amount to abuse, namely uh, submitting false uh, information, documents, uh, making uh, disparaging statements about the, about the parties, about the court, about the process and so on, disclosing confidential information. But I think it's important uh, always to try to control your clients as well and, and to make sure that they don't abuse the right of individual application. 
Then there are several grounds of incompatibility and you have to make sure that, uh, that this case is competent vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the state concern. Nowadays, you can no longer submit an application against the Russian Federation for the events that happened after 16 September 2022. So if such a case would be lodged, it is incompatible at some persona. Then your country against which the application is lodged has to, needs to have jurisdiction. It has to be uh, individual, needs to be under the jurisdiction of the country concerned. The court has to be a competent rational temporis, and also the substance of the complaint you have in, you have raised um, uh, needs to be needs to fall within the scope of the provision that has been uh, uh, invoked. This is rational materia jurisdiction. The court may de declare cases inadmissible as manifestly unfounded. This very often happens on the basis of the doctrine of fourth instance complaints, namely that the European court was uh, initially not established, nor it has ever been, nor it can be a court that is examining the, the various factual problems and disagreements in, say, questioning of witnesses or things like this at the domestic level. These are four, fourth instance complaints which cannot be examined by the court. Also, very often cases as manifestly found that are declared inadmissible because they are unsubstantiated, or there may be other reasons. For example, if, if there is already a case of the court that shows that for a particular situation, uh, the issue is clearly uh, uh, no violation. In that case, the case may be declared inadmissible as manifestly found. And finally, the uh, admissibility criterion of sig significant disadvantage uh, so, if the applicant did not suffer significant uh, disadvantage at the domestic level, this may, this may be a case which simply does not warrant international examination. Previously, there were two safeguard clauses for this. First one was that the court may decide otherwise if the respect for human rights so requires. And uh, the second safeguard clause was whether the case was duly examined at the domestic uh, level. With the coming into force of protocol number 15, uh, the second safeguard clause duly examined at the domestic level was uh, abolished. So now, even if the, if the case has not been examined at the domestic level, the court may still declare it inadmissible for no significant uh, uh, disadvantage. 